And I want to just take, take a moment to look at the, the execution of cash and the, the resume. And this is something which often we get sort of a lot of questions about, and uh, we, we really just touched on it quite lightly uh, to start with. I'm going to just paste for you how Nextflow resume works. And is this basically a two-part blog series, a two-part blog series on this material if you want to go in deeper. But it, it, it kind of goes in here and shows you a little bit about how how this works and this applies to cloud as well as to uh, as well as the cluster execution and it also applies to the to the hybrid part here so when we're running inside of our working directory and we say next floor resume what actually takes place there and what, what, what does it run so we have in here the the working directory of a couple of tasks which have run and the first one was the index task we ran as usual the second one we've got the the gut sample which is run in here and the way that it's working here in terms of this, the quantification step, you can see that we have both the inputs, which is, this is an input here, symbolically linked to this location. And then we have the, the index, which is an input symbolically linked to the previous run. So the previous task. So notice how this is 12, one AD, and this is 12, one AD here. So these two, the kind of link between them, is really this this file here? And that's, that's kind of that, that's the kind of linking is coming from the channel and it creates the dependencies between them. The other important parts is that we have the actual files that were created. In this case, the first task, the index, and the second task, the actual gut. These are the files that were created, and we also know that there's also the dot command, etc., which which takes place. So what happens when you do that? And you say next for run resume. Imagine that both of those tasks were already there. Well, what happens is we really start from the top of the pipeline, so from the, going through the channels, and it gets to this point here and it says, okay, I, it creates a hash of, of the, basically the previous execution, which is made up of quite a few things. I'll just kind of show you, kind of linking it through. What is it made up? It's made up of the, the, the input values. So if we had a value like sample ID, et cetera, made up of the input files themselves and when they've been touched last, basically when they're last changed. We've got the command line string, which is the script section that we have. Because I can make this a bit bigger for you. Command line string, the container ID, if we use the Condor environment, environment modules, and any executed scripts, so anything in the bin directory. So all of those things get calculated for every task every time that we do resume. And what they do is that looks for, basically calculates that, which creates a, this 128 bit hash. And that's what is defined. Oh, sorry, apologies. But that is what's defined here. So this is the 128 bit hash. This 12. And it's kind of this works in a pretty cool way. So now you're basically you can know what you're expecting. So next floor can know if nothing is touched, if, nothing, if everything is expected, if everything is exactly the same, it will say there should be a working directory called 12, 1 AD, et cetera. And it should have a successful exit code. So inside here, there should be a, a successful exit code. And there should be this file because this is an output file. So this, this index directory should exist. Now, if all of those things evaluate is true, you can say, yes, this task completed successfully. Everything is in there and I can go on to the next task. So every time you run resume, we're doing this for every task. We're kind of starting from the top very quickly, kind of going through this, what happens if I get to a stage though where I touch this file? So imagine I just change this by one value. Then when you're gonna get here, the next downstream task, in this case, this task here, the number's not gonna be the same. So that by touching, even just changing one of the input files here, the downstream task hash will be different. And therefore it's gonna say, hey, is there this hash, which does not exist, I've made a modified something above, it's not going to exist and it's going to start that task and launch that task. And that's really how the, um, the, the whole kind of mechanism works in that way. So this is kind of describes a little bit, hopefully you can kind of see here, if that exists, if the, if the command line exists and, uh, and how that works. The nice thing about this, you can even specify like a working directory that is like in a shared location. So if you work very often in a big group, you can keep like a big working directory. And if anyone in your group has run that same pipeline 
or that same task really on that same data, then it's not going to have to not going to have to um, run that there as well. The actual hash we calculate on the input file, so the complete file path, the file size, the, the last modified timestamp. If you want to jump in there and see a little bit more as well, you can see there's a, a following blog post on here, which, which kind of looks into some common troubleshooting problems. So this is a, the caching mechanism is very powerful. It also ends up in a lot of situations where people are un not understanding why something is being resumed. That will often be taking place because the file that may be modified, it could be that the file system, particularly in the shared file system, because it's kind of got copies of those files, it may just change the timestamp by a very small amount, like you know, microseconds of, of, of timestamp difference. And therefore, Nextflow, when it looks at that file, it will say, okay, that's not the same. And therefore, it's not going to show that. So this is something which can happen. You can often be in situations, this is the inconsistency of the, of the shared file systems like NFS. There's obviously modes that you can change the leniency of that caching mechanism so that it doesn't do that. If you modify the input of a, of a, of a process with a downstream process, that's obviously not so good. And, and you can also be in situations where you have race conditions of the variables where you're, you're overriding that as well. Okay. I'll just leave this here for reference. There's a whole bunch of other ways that you can check this and, and, and look into uh, what's possible there for doing that as well. Uh, this describes a little bit the working directory. How do you want to organize your experiments? And how do you want to kind of think about it? Well, when you're running with Nextflow itself, you've got this option for saying Nextflow log. And if we go into our one here and we say Nextflow log, we'll see that we've got basically everything that we've been running um, for, the last, for the last few days is everything here. And I can even say, if I want to go back and, uh, and choose a specific version of a pipeline that I wish to run, you can even say, okay, I want to go resume that version there. And, and this provides you a little bit of ability to, to go back and, and, and run that there as well. There's a bunch of options here in terms of viewing that in a different way. So if you want to say, for example, let's take a particular run that we've made and we want to list all of the working directories that were made up of that, we can use this next flow run, specify the name of that as well. And you can also just see the different versions. So if you want to say, okay, just show me the processes or just show me the processes that should match a particular name. And then there's a little uh, thing for, for producers. A lot of this has been sort of superseded by Nextflow Tower, which obviously takes care of a lot of the logging and, and makes all of this a lot easier. And uh, I think that's the, that's the kind of end of the, of the kind of course material here.